This is Richard Socher, <laughs> Richard Socher. He's the person who published the first paper on how to map language in vector spaces, making him the great, great grandfather, he's 41 now, of all large language models on this planet. I'm sure, and I'm serious, he will get a Nobel Prize or at least a Turing Award. Richard isn't just a researcher, he's also a highly successful entrepreneur. You were equi-hired by Salesforce at one point in time, and he became a chief scientist of Salesforce, and as Steffi mentioned, now he's doing you.com. Uh, you run an investment fund, um, 50 million, 100 million, 50 million? Uh, about half a billion AUM. Half a billion. Um, <laughs> he grew up in Dresden. <laughs> and now lives in Silicon Valley in a beautiful uh, mountain ranch, which is still there, uh, luckily, and which, which became a kind of secret hub of the AI community. So you once told me years ago that you have a bet with one of the OpenAI founders about uh, the future of AI. So who won? And what was the bet again? Yeah, so the bet, I think we started in 2017 at a NURBS conference, and I still had my, even though I was working on AI, and had been working on AI at that point already for quite some time, I had my uh, German skepticism still about the hype uh, that uh, he was talking about, and he said, for sure in 10 years we'll have AGI. And I'm like, I'm very optimistic, I think we're gonna get there eventually, but that seems overly optimistic, uh, again, Deutsche Grundskepsis, uh, like German skepticism. So I, I said, let's just make a bet. Uh, we had some drinks already. I wrote it on a napkin. We took pictures. We added some Google Calendar uh, invites to it. And I think in about two years, the following three things have to be true for him to win the bet. Uh, I'll have to have a maid, a robotic maid, that will clean my entire house the way that um, my current maid team does. Um, we'll have to have a translation of a Pulitzer Prize winning like book, a famous book, be completely done automatically by an AI with no human intervention and publish that translation as the main official translation. Uh, and it has to win a Millennium Math Prize, uh, which is one of the hardest math problems in the world. If you solve one of those math problems, you win a million dollars and you know, you're sort of very, very famous forever uh, in the history of all of math. Uh, and so he was very confident that that will happen. I think he has two more years left, so we don't know yet. Um, now the funny thing is, he may lose that $1,000 bet, but he probably became a billionaire in the process uh, of being <laughs> wrong. So I think it's one of the many reasons why uh, I let go of my German skepticism. I'm going much more optimistically into the future. Something else happened since we talked last time on the stage. AI got two Nobel Prizes, right? Which was, for me, a total surprise. So how, how do you look at this? Is AI taking over science more and more? I'm aware of the fact that you're writing a book about stuff like that, so maybe you can give us your view on science and AI in this, in this field. Yeah, so I'm, I'm actually extremely excited, and you see a lot of folks, when they think about what's the most amazing use case of, an, uh, of AI, period, it is actually when we apply AI to science, you know, physics, chemistry, biology. I think a lot of science is amazing. Science mostly tries to understand things. I would argue that in the future, I would much rather see science engineering as a goal, where instead of understanding cancer, we can cure cancer. Instead of understanding how batteries work, we can build better batteries. Uh, instead of understanding just how fusion works, we can actually build uh, energy positive fusion reactors and all of those kinds of things. And so uh, if you have an AI that can work 24 seven, read everything there is to read about the world, and you actually give that AI access to a simulation, then it might go above what any human scientist or even the you know, group of all human scientists ever could have done. And I think that will even more change the human condition than AI already has right now. And so I'm incredibly excited uh, about that. And that's why that book is sort of about the AI, AI for science and the science of uh, AI to some degree as well. And um, yeah. I'm a premium subscriber of you.com. And since you shared your ideas for the first time, I'm, I'm really proud. I knew of the project before it started. I think you pivoted at least two times or three times. So what are you doing these days with... So JetGPT happened and everything changed. The world 
went upside down. What, what are you doing today with the project? Yeah, I would answer or summarize you.com as answers, agents, and AGI. Answers is sort of our lifeblood. That's what we've been doing for a while. So in that sense, there's never been a pivot. But we had focused much more on consumers. But it turns out a lot of consumers have fairly simple informational needs. They might ask, what was the score of that soccer game last night? What's the weather tomorrow? Um, and things like that. And there's not much you can do just from first principles to be 10x better than Google this, on those simple kinds of questions. Now, where AI gets better and better is the more complex the questions get, and you actually have fairly complex informational needs, which is the case for students a lot and for knowledge workers. And so as we've actually uh, opened up a subscription model uh, last year, we've seen massive growth. And now we're working with huge companies like the DPA, Deutsche Presseagentur, Wort und Bild Verlag, uh, other publishers, Hansa Merkur, insurance companies. Uh, as a nerd, I'm very excited about the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, where Einstein and Oppenheimer worked. Uh, as an ex-physicist, I'm sure you, you approve. Um, and so we're very excited about those kinds of customers because they care about the accuracy and the fact that we have much higher accuracy than ChatGPT. In fact, a lot of our largest customers first had failed projects with ChatGPT and then switched to e.com because we're more accurate. And we're more accurate because we've actually worked on both search and large language models and AI for now many years. In fact, we've had the first LM in a search engine uh, in 2021, a year before ChatGPT came out. We also patented LMs for search, so some interesting patent questions we'll have to uh, ask ourselves at some point. Um, and, and then we're the first to connect large language models to the web so you can actually have citations. And the citations really point to the right place of where they found stuff. You can kind of fake citations too, which we've seen some of our competition do, where you just kind of sprinkle links into the answer of mm. uh, a ChatGPT-like model. Uh, but it's hard to get it all right and accurate. After OpenAI happened, every software was suddenly AI-enabled, right? So the new sticker on the software. Now everyone's building agents. You also pivoted a little bit on the front end. Now you have all these agents, and you can build your own engines and stuff like that. So what is going on? So where, where are we heading there in, the, in this new field? Yeah, so you can think of most of the breakthroughs of AI over the last couple of years as essentially what I would call neural sequence models. Neural, because they're large neural networks, you know, large algorithms with billions and billions of parameters you can train very well. Sequences, uh, in terms of any kind of sequence, a sequence of words, and you get a ChatGPT-like model. But you can also have sequences of clicks and actions. And as these AIs are trained on these sequences of clicks and actions, they become agents. And when you think about all the jobs that can be done by purely talking, that's a lot of jobs, but then if you then expand that to all the jobs that can be done by talking and clicking inside a browser, that's even more jobs and even more workflows that are going to change. And so we've just heard from some editors that research and work on the internet that used to take them four days now takes them a day, right? And so they're much, much more productive when they can outsource essentially their work to these AI agents. We've now had over 50,000 of those kinds of agents built by both our normal uh, prosumers, like uh, subscribers and customers, but also especially companies. And I think that will change the entire way we do knowledge work. And really, when you think about it, most of the people in this room are knowledge workers. When you deal with knowledge, you read things on the internet, you have to combine things in service, sales, marketing. This is all different kinds of knowledge work. And essentially, whatever workflow you have, you can now explain that to an AI, create an agent for it, and then it does it for you. But it, it doesn't work, does it? It so, actually works. So for, yeah. for people like me, so did, you book, so did your AI agent book your journey to DLD this week? So we are not doing... Yeah, I know, I know but agents. you could use... So we see all these demos. I remember this right. great demo of uh, Google some years ago. Right. Where someone so so the AI booked a table in a restaurant. Right, right, right. It, it's it was really impressive. I have the feeling that we are in this demo stage still. So, so there's no real application for people like me. So I think you, as a knowledge worker, could definitely use it definitely. to do your research work, right? Mm. And those are the kinds of agents that we focus on. That's what we're doing with DBA, DPA, Deutsche yeah. Presseagentur, and others. Um, I think when it comes to these. 
demos where I saw this one demo too where the CEO was like, book me this trip to London with my family and they're like, yes, 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 and I'm done. I'm like, that was clearly fake, right? Because if you've ever booked a flight with a bunch of kids and a hotel and so on, you know there's just a lot of subtleties. And then you realize like, well, Expedia kind of figured out the right interface for most of those things with all the different options. And I think there's currently an uncanny valley where these systems are not yet personalized enough. They haven't in some ways learned enough about you uh, mm -hmm. and invaded your privacy enough, and another way of describing that, to know, well, this user is willing to wait an extra 50 minutes but save maybe $50, whereas mm -hmm. for another user, that's worth like $1,000 to not have to wait 50 minutes because mm -hmm. they're really wealthy. And so uh, knowledge, like, knowledge assistants work already. Personal sort of consumer assistants don't work that well yet. Mm -hmm. You think a lot about the future of this stuff. So can you give us a vision where we are heading? Is it something like, hey, AI, hey, agent, can you solve the climate crisis or something like that? Or is it, what, what can we do with, with AI agents in the future? Right, so part of why I summarize you.com as answers agents and AGI is that uh, we're also helping actually a lot of companies kind of guide them into this journey of AGI. And I do think- and Artificial general intelligence, that's sorry. Right. So, so. Um, that's right, so models that are even more general purpose and are more and more human-like. Uh, and I don't think we're fully there yet, but I do think all of knowledge work is going to change. In fact, I think if I had to summarize what that future looked like, one thing I can be certain of is that almost all of us who are currently doing individual contributor work are going to be much more be to become managers. We will manage our AIs. And when you have become a manager and you remember sort of your path from being an individual contributor to becoming a manager, it's also not easy, right? You have to learn how to communicate tasks really well, how to check uh, if people are doing things correctly, and then as you build trust with them, then you can kind of let them do their own thing more and more, uh, and you have to be very precise about your language and the corner cases of how a job is done correctly and where it might fail and things like that, but we're all going to become managers and then, uh, in fact, I'm going on to this Davos panel about the one-person company next week, and I think that's a little bit optimistic, but maybe, you know, you can be a five or 50-person multi-billion dollar company. That's not that crazy anymore if you use agents very well. Mm. You also think about, so, so you tweet, I think it was were some tweets where you thought about um, how can we measure intelligence of AIs, which is a problem, and how can we follow up if, if there's a real development. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? So what is intelligence from your point of view? Yeah, um, I'll try to do that in the five minutes we have left and not an hour as a former professor. Um, so I think initially AI started with just trying to map human intelligence. And then you can think about the different ways that humans are intelligent. Some are differentiating us more from animals than others. We have motor intelligence, right? You can make a lot of money if you can, with very small variants, get specific balls into specific areas very, very, uh, you know, uh, consistently. Uh, so motor intelligence uh, can be quite valuable in golf and soccer and whatnot. Um, then we have visual intelligence. Uh, we understand the world, we can navigate the world, we understand and can identify objects and people and things like that. Uh, then we have also language intelligence. I think language is the most interesting manifestation of human intelligence. It differentiates us the most from other animals in terms of the complexity and enables us to create knowledge and to pass that knowledge down once the civilization invented you know, written language uh, into future generations. And so, and then there's logical reasoning, there's just knowledge accumulation and, and things like that. And I think as we look at AI, uh, there are actually certain types of intelligence where we're essentially already close to maxing it out. Like identifying objects in the visual world, AI is probably just as good in the next few years will be as good as humans on classifying and identifying all the objects on the planet. When it comes to knowledge accumulation, there are the upper bound uh, is massive, and it's basically related to physics and the speed of light cone around all the sensors that an AI can ingest, and we're light years away from maxing out the amount of knowledge you can have about the entirety of the universe. So as you have to look at these, as you, have, as you look at these different dimensions of intelligence, you, can, you have to acknowledge that in some cases AI is close to maxing out and is close to where humans are, and in other cases 
it is not as far as humans are and it won't be at the maximum level for a very long time. I assume that you will have kids one day. <laughs> Hopefully. Just in case, what would be your recommendation? I'm asking for another father on stage. Um, how should we educate kids in the future? In yeah. this world you're describing. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I think there are some sad outcomes uh, in terms of certain things once we have tools to do them for us, we just don't need to be as good at those tasks anymore. And you see this with kids who grew up with Google Maps, they just don't know how to read maps anymore. Um, and in some ways they can navigate, <laughs> they can navigate just fine because they always have that tool with them. Uh, and often I think it is okay to, you know, we don't know how to multiply large numbers that quickly in our heads anymore because we've all had calculators now for a very long time and that's okay. I think what we'll have to teach kids is more and more uh, taste and, and the ability to discern what good looks like, what good content looks like, what a good essay looks like, what is a good argument to have in the middle of a conversation. Uh, and having a conversation won't be automated by ChatGPT, right? You have to still think on your feet when you get interviewed by people like Jochen, uh, and you can't just be like, uh, let me ask ChatGPT and then uh, you know, answer uh, by reading off that answer. So uh, I think discerning and classifying content. Gen AI will create more and more content. It'll write an essay, especially mediocre like student essays, like very well for you, but you need to understand if it's still good or not. I would still argue that every kid uh, should learn how to program because then this technology goes from magic to a program that it is. And then you have much more agency on changing what the world will look like as you have control over that technology. Anil Seth is... <laughs> That definitely started by a programmer, that class. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you um, heard the talk of Anil Seth. He's the most important guy when it comes to human consciousness. Do you think that machines will be conscious one day? So they reflect about themselves and... I don't think there's a philosophical reason why they cannot be. Uh, but I want to be very clear that currently no one is working on conscious machines because if you just had a fully self-aware conscious machine that decides what it wants to do and you go to it and you just spend billions and billions of dollars, it's run on this like very complex, huge cluster, you spend billions of dollars on your GPUs and you say, all right, now answer all these customer emails for me, please, so my service department is, is more automated. And it says, no, I'd rather understand the molecular composition of Venus. Thank you, bye. You're like, wait a minute, that's not why I spent billions of dollars. So there are not, there's no company right now that spends any amount of resources on those kinds of machines and I don't think it's, it will just happen uh, if you have more and more parameters of a large language model. And so it may happen sooner, it may happen only in 100 years, we just don't know uh, because there's not much progress on it mm. right now. Very last question. In our first interview, I asked you to develop a Socha test, which was like, if I'm in a chat interface, how can I decide if there's a machine on the other end or not? Yes. So, um, the, the example you gave me was great, but ChatGPT killed the test. Yeah, so LMS there, can now solve So it. how can I find out if someone on the other end in the chat interface is a real person or a machine? There's actually uh, some really funny screenshots of people doing that right now. Um, there's a customer service uh, you know, chat window and the person is like, okay, uh, I have this problem and they're like, I'm happy to help you with. And they ask like, are you human? and said, yes, I am, uh, my name is Jason. Uh, and they're like, all right, write me uh, a perfect HTML code uh, oh. interface <laughs> that does this. And like two seconds later, it was like, <laughs> <laughs> like Okay, so uh, smart. That's, that's, the, that's the answer now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you.